welcome to the Spring Hill broadcast. This is Pastor T, and I am so glad, excited, and blessed to have you all join us for Bible study online tonight. Listen, if you're joining us from somewhere around the Gainesville region, welcome. Or even if you're joining us from somewhere else in the state of Florida, outside the state of Florida, somewhere else in the United States, or even around the globe, we have prayed for, planned for, and prepared for the opportunity to worship God together through this medium. And so we are praising God that he's given us this chance. Let's look to the Lord in prayer uh, as we seek his guidance in the word. Father, we thank you that your word is inspired and we are so grateful that you have given us your word. Thank you for the opportunity to study. Thank you for the blessings that you've given us all throughout this day and the mercy that you have met us with at this moment. Father, we pray that you forgive us of our sins, take away faults, failures, and our, our unrighteousness, create within us clean hearts and renew right spirits within us. Father, we pray that as we prepare to study the word that you'd open our minds, help us to understand, pray that you soften our hearts and help us to spiritually receive. We pray if there's someone that's not saved, that you would save by the power of the word. We pray for all of us that you sanctify us. And Lord, we pray for all to be strengthened by your holy word. Father, there are so many that are dealing with sicknesses, so many that are dealing with grief, so many that are dealing with pressures and pains, unmentionable. But Lord, we know that you have all things in your control. And so we pray our Father in Jesus' name that you'd help us, that you meet us at our point of need. But most of all, God, we pray that you draw us closer to you. We can make it through anything, God, if you'll just simply go with us. These things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I love the Lord Jesus and I love his word. Will you join me please in his word in the book of Psalms, Psalm 119, verses 153 through 160. Psalm number 119, verses 153 through 160. Psalm 119, verse 153 through 160. May I share with you that the Lord's word is split. The canon of scripture that we have called the, the Bible is split into two halves, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, the Old Testament has 39 books, 17. The first 17 are historical. The last 17 are prophetical. And then sandwiched in the middle are the poetical books. The poetical books are sandwiched in the middle. And that's where we are continually drawing our lesson from tonight. Psalm 119, again, is the longest pericope of scripture. It's the longest segment of scripture, and it is all dedicated to the word of God. May I share with you that I was reading uh, an article uh, just a couple of days ago. It might have been yesterday or, or it might even been uh, today. Uh, and it was startling to me uh, to see the responses that people made about the word of God and how the word of God is changing as the times change and the culture changes, that the word of God is dynamic and it, and it changes in its meaning and understanding. And friend, may I share with you the word of God doesn't change. The word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Now, our understanding of the word of God uh, may have diminished, but God's word has not changed. And I won't even say that our understanding of the word of God has changed and elevated because in our current culture and our current cultural climate, it shows that we don't understand God's word very well. Uh, many times when you see certain things going on in the world and people turning a blind eye and a deaf ear to it, it means that we just don't understand the word and don't believe the word. But friend, I'm praying that through our continual study and our prayers and our, uh, our, our seeking to uh, uh, follow God's word, I'm praying that it will give us greater spiritual faithfulness and fidelity to the eternal word of God that changes not. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Psalm 119 verses 153 uh, through 160 says this, Consider mine affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget thy law. Plead my cause and deliver me. Quicken me according to thy word. Salvation is far from the wicked because they don't seek your statutes. Great are your tender mercies, O Lord. Quicken me or make me alive according to your judgments. Many are my persecutors and my enemies. Yet do I not decline from thy testimonies. I beheld the transgressors and was grieved because they did not keep, they kept not your word. Consider how I love thy precepts. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. 
Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endures forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Tonight's message is the merciful word. The merciful word. God's word is merciful. This particular passage of scripture encapsulates the psalmist's heartfelt cries and unwavering trust in God's word, even in the midst of affliction. In this portion of scripture, beloved, uh, you'll understand that uh, we witness the psalmist's plea for deliverance and his resolute commitment to follow God's law, even in the face of fierce opposition. Uh, David, whom we believe the writer of this psalm, begins with a sincere cry for help in verse 153, acknowledging that it is only through God's deliverance that true salvation can be found. He recognizes the limitation of uh, human aid, reminding us of our desperate need uh, for the divine intervention of God. And in verse 154, he emphasizes there God's steadfast love and his faithfulness. And he finds solace in the unchanging nature of God's promises. Amidst all of the persecution and adversity, as stated in verse 157, the psalmist remains resolved, refusing to compromise his faith. He is unwavering in his devotion, uh, inspires, and his devotion inspires us to stand firm in our convictions and in our obedience to God's commands. Listen, ultimately, uh, the passage highlights the psalmist's deep joy and delight in meditating on God's word. And through our study, we're invited to reflect on and we, we're challenged to look at how God can elevate us to a place of calm, peace, and even joy, despite all of the things that are going on around us, if we keep an unwavering and an unshakable faith in the very word of God. He will comfort us and he will give us confidence despite all of the challenges that are happening around us because his word is a merciful word. Here are three things I want you to see. Number one, his, his word is merciful. Uh, there's mercy in afflictions, mercy in afflictions, mercy in afflictions, verses 153 through 157. He asks, first of all, that, that uh, remember me as I remember you in affliction. He asked God, Lord, remember me as I remember you in my affliction. How does he do that? Look in verse 153 uh, of your scripture. Consider mine affliction. That, that's to remember. Think about me, Lord, uh, and deliver me. I can't deliver myself, God, but you can. For I do not forget thy law. He says, now, I want you to remember me as I remember your holy word. And so he's asking for God's consideration in the midst of his trouble and trials. Then in verse 154, he said, plead my cause and deliver me. Quicken me, make me alive, give me life back according to your word. He said, I'm going to remain consistent and considerate of your word. And Lord, I'm praying that you will show yourself faithful uh, in delivering me because I'm in a place where I cannot deliver myself. And one of the things I want us to see, friend, is that the word of God will pull us out of the challenges and pull us out and pull us through and, and, and set us into a different place and perspective in life if we remain faithful to the holy word of God. Exodus chapter three, verse number seven. Exodus chapter three, verse number seven. You can turn to your copy of the scriptures there. Exodus chapter three, verse number seven. God says this, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the afflictions of my people, which are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Look at this. 400 years, they've, uh, the children of Israel have been in bondage, and God says and speaks anthropomorphically, he's, uh, uh, we see human characteristics assigned to a divine or, or a divine being or to a deity. He said, I have seen, uh, I have looked. Uh, God doesn't necessarily have eyes, but he can, he can look and see everywhere. Uh, th that's a, a form of anthropomorphism. He said, I have heard their cry. 
I've seen and I've heard with my ears. I've heard their cry by reason of what the taskmasters have done to them. And here's, here's the, the major point of that, that statement. I know their sorrows. God says, I saw, I heard, but more than that, it has been registered in my heart and in my mind. I know their sorrows. Friend, understand this. There's an underlying principle that is baked into that passage in Exodus chapter three, verse number seven. And that is this, that God sees us, God hears us, but also God knows all about our troubles. And he is moved with compassion to help us in the midst of our troubles. And that's what David is asking. David is saying, Lord, consider me. Psalm 35, verse number one says this, plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. He said, Lord, I need you to fight my battle and I need you to win my case. I need you to go into the courtroom of life and of time and I need you to plead my case. Fight against them that fight against me. He says, Lord, I'm too weak to fight. I'm tired of fighting. Uh, I have insufficient means to fight against so many problems and so many enemies. So Lord, please fight for me. Friend, may I share this with you? And I'm so grateful. I'm glad. I'm, I'm privileged to be able to, to stand here tonight and to share this truth with you that God will fight your battles for you. And so this is what the, the psalmist is asking for. But notice there, there's a key statement in verse 153. He says in 153, uh, for I do not forget your law. And it's a recurring phrase that comes up time and again in Psalm 119. And Psalm 119, uh, 119 verse 16 says, I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget thy word. In Psalm 119 verse 109, it says, my soul is continually in my hand, yet do I not Forget thy law. In Psalm 119, verse 141, I am small and despised, yet do not I forget thy precepts. In Psalm 119, verse 176, he'll say it again. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandment. He said it earlier in Psalm 44, verse 17, all this has come upon us, yet have not we forgotten thee, neither have we dealt falsely in thy covenant. Friend, I don't care where life takes you. I don't care what problems come up against you. Always remember this. Don't ever forget the word of God. Don't forget God's word and don't forsake God's word in the midst of whatever challenges you're dealing with. Stand firm on the very word of God. But for us, that's a challenge because you can't forget what you haven't first learned. And so if we're not going to forget it, what do we have to do? We have to first learn the word, study the word so that we can stand firm on the word of God. And despite everything that's going on against us, we will remind ourselves God's word is true and I'll stand based on the word of God. Here, he says also, I need you to rebuke my enemies and, and revive the faithful in verses 119, excuse me, 155 through 156. Psalm 119, verse 155 through 156. This is what he said. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not thy statutes. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord, Quicken me according to thy judgments. He said salvation is far from the wicked. How, why? Because the wicked aren't seeking the word. And it's by the word of God that we are saved, that we are transformed. It's by, by the truth that is found in God's word. And if we're far from the word, we, we are far from God's salvation. Listen, friend, you can't get saved without following the word of God. You can't get saved apart from the word of God. Understand this, that people will tell you all kind of things, but understand we need God's word, even if it is, is as simple as John three sixteen. for God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Faith comes by hearing, friend. That's what Paul says in Romans. And hearing by what? The word of God. But if we are, are not wanting to be connected to the word, if we don't want to follow the word, then we cannot be saved. We cannot be saved. He says salvation is far from the wicked. And there are so many people today that will never be saved because they will never follow God's holy word. Psalm number 10, verse number four says, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Proverbs chapter one, verse number seven, Proverbs chapter one, verse number seven says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. On this previous Sunday, I preached about uh, the, the Pharisees and their unforgivable sin. Jesus said that they have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. And so they cannot, they, they, they cannot be forgiven of this. What does this mean? It's because they had decided in their heart that they were not going to accept what God was doing through Christ Jesus. And they had basically said, I don't care how many signs I see. I don't care how many miracles Jesus does. I don't care what kind of power he teaches with. We with we will not accept Jesus Christ as Savior. And friend, that's the way the wicked are. They will refuse the truth of God's holy word. And you can't have mercy uh, without the word of God. Psalm 119 uh, verse 156 uh, shows us this. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord. Quicken me according to thy judgments. God's mercy is great. Uh, that's why David was able to pray, have mercy upon me, O Lord, and uh, according to thy loving kindness and according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. That, uh, that's Psalm 51, verse number one. Uh, he was able to pray that prayer because he knew about the mercy of God. Friend, understand this, that God's mercy is great, plenteous and wondrous, but we have to follow God's word. So number two, number two. We, we ask for mercy because of our assailants, mercy because of assailants. In verse 157 through 158, look at what the psalmist says. Many are my persecutors and my enemies. He said many. It, it, this, this phrase offers a profound theological perspective on the unwavering devotion of God's law that even though we have many enemies, that God's law is still sufficient. In verse uh, the clause B of 157, it says, yet do I not decline from that testimonies. He says, despite whatever I'm dealing with, I'm still going to remain faithful to God's holy word. It's an amazing statement that we should have unwavering faith in God's law, even in the face of affliction and persecution. The verse states that many are my persecutors and my adversaries but I do not swerve from your testimonies. Here the psalmist acknowledges the fact and the reality of opposition and adversaries in his life, yet he resolutely affirms his unwavering commitment to God's testimonies and refuses to compromise his faith in God. The theological impl implications here uh, is, is this, that when you look at the, the, the truth of the text, it's significant because it highlights the endurance and steadfastness of true faith in the midst of adversity. The psalmist refused to swerve from God's testimonies in the face of however much persecution he has. He said, I'm going to rely on the truth of God. And it's a challenging uh, a statement for us because it challenges us to reflect on our own response to opposition and adversity, prompting us to hold fast. That means hold uh, like super glue to God's word, even when we are faced with opposition or pressure to compromise. Next thing that it shows us is that it speaks to the importance of unwavering obedience to God's law, regardless of the circumstances. The psalmist's commitment to God's testimony demonstrates his profound understanding of their value and authority in guiding his life. It reminds us that the unchanging nature of God's commandments and need for faithful adherence to them is, 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 is necessary and irrespective of external pressures or temptation. Psalm uh, 119 verse 157 lets us see that endurance and faith in God's word is what's needed 
despite all of the trouble that happens all around us. We continue to trust God and continue to do like the saints of old uh, would sing, and we still sing it today, hold to God's unchanging hand. But here he said it's, it's a pitiful state that our assailants are in. In verse 158 it says, I beheld the transgressors and I was grieved because they kept not thy word. He looks and he sees faithlessness with disgust because they do not keep God's commands. He expresses here a deep, deep remorse. I mean, he's deeply sorrowful and it's a it's a it bothers him uh, as he looks with moral discernment and righteous indignation towards those that that disregard God's God's commandments. The verse highlights the psalmist's strong conviction and uncompromising stance in upholding the importance uh, and obedience to God's law. The implication here for us is this, that, that uh, the verse requires a careful consideration. It underscores the importance of recognizing the, the distinction between righteousness and wickedness. The psalmist is disgusted about the faithlessness that is seen reflected in those that are against him and against God and his firm understanding of the moral standard that is set forth by God. Friend, listen, you and I ought to be grieved in our heart when we see so-called Christians that don't believe the word of God, so-called churches that don't believe the word of God, a nation that doesn't believe the word of God. And you say, well, pastor, uh, how do you know people don't believe the word of God? Look at how we treat one another. Look at how we deal with each other. Look at how mean spirited people are. Look at how much people gossip, backbite, backstab, how much people refuse to share the gospel. We don't believe the word of God. How wicked uh, our nation has become. We don't believe the word of God. And as Christians, we ought to be grieved, but the reason many of us are not grieved, and as a pastor, I'm grieved at churches that won't follow the word of God. The reason we aren't grieved is because we want to follow, as Vody Bauckham likes to call it, the 11th commandment, which is thou shalt be nice. We don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And so we don't want to tell people when they're right, when they're wrong. And uh, we, we'll say, well, that's, that's just people, different people have a different interpretation. Listen, there are some things that are not left up to interpretation and there's no ambiguity in the scripture. There are some things that are just very clear. It says what it says. It means what it means. Here's the problem. It's not in the interpretation. It's in the fact that many of us don't want to apply it. So it's not in the interpretation. It's in the application. And if the application rubs me the wrong way and doesn't go the way I wanted to go, you know what I'll do is I'll put the word of God to the side. I'll ignore that particular piece. And that's what he's talking about, the faithlessness that's seen and how they just will not follow the word of God. And so it's a reminder that we need to have unwavering commitment to the word of God. Lastly, and number three, and we're done, is the mercy with reassurance. In verse 159 and 160, it said, consider how I love thy precepts. I love your word. So make me alive, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endures forever. Every word of God is true and it endures forever. Proverbs chapter 30, verse number five. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Second Timothy chapter three, verses 16 through 17. Second Timothy chapter three, verses 16 through 17. Second Timothy chapter three, verses 16 through 17. All scripture. What does all mean? Everything. From Genesis to Revelation, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, for righteousness. Uh, that verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And you say, well, uh, pastor, now you you know uh, contextually and you know hermeneutically that that uh, the New Testament was not written by the time uh, Paul is writing in Second Timothy. So what does he mean by all scripture? OK, fine. Take Genesis to Malachi. All of that is inspired of God and God can use that to get us saved into a, a saving knowledge of him uh, and his work. But we won't even follow Genesis to Malachi, much less uh, from Matthew to Revelation. But all of it 
the canon of scripture. And, and one day I'll teach a class about the canonization of scripture. But the fact about it is all of it is God breathed from Genesis to Revelation. That first statement in Genesis chapter one, verse one, where Moses writes in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, setting God above all and greater than all as creator and sustainer of all things, all the way down to, to the last period in Revelation where he says, amen, period. God has given us his word and it is eternal. It wasn't good for just back then. It's not good just sometimes. It's not good for when you want it and when you don't want it. God's word is true and it is everlasting. The question is, will our faith in God be everlasting? God bless you. I love you. Walk in victory.